with me as we sing this song, Brother, Let Me Be Your Servant. Kindly stand with me. Thank you. Please take your seats and let's go to the Lord in prayer together, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we come this evening and we want to say thank you so much for being so merciful to us today from morning till now, for the manner in which you've spoken to us, O oh God, from your word. We want to thank you, our Father. We did pray this morning, praying for the men who are going to stand before us, including this evening, praying, O oh God, for ourselves that we might uh, be spoken to in a manner that will bring you honor and glory. And we want to believe that you've answered those prayers, O oh God. The manner in which you enabled your servants to stand and to clearly proclaim your word. We want to say thank you so much. We pray now, O oh God, as we were challenged, not only once, but many times this day, that, O oh God, the things that we have learned might be things that we will translate into lives that are holy, lives that are caring, kind and merciful, lives that are committed to upholding the truth of the gospel. Our Father, we thank you and we pray that you might help us. This evening we are back again and want to pray, oh God, for the program. We pray for the songs that we, the song we have sung and the songs we will sing. We pray for the man's servant, Pastor Rob, as he comes at an opportune time to bring your word. We pray that you might enable him to stand in the power that only the Holy Spirit can give. We want to pray for us, our Father, that you might help us to be attentive, to listen to that which you've ordained for us today. We pray for the media team, the musicians, as they lead us in bringing honor and glory to you, 
that our Father them too you might bless, that together, O oh God, we might have a testimony at the close of our time together that we have been in the presence of God. And so we ask, O oh God, that you might begin with us and end with us. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. I will now invite uh, Elder Charles Botter to come home. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you again. A fuller house than last night, that's for sure. Some quick announcements, and then I'll ask Pastor Mbewe to do what we normally do on a Tuesday night, which is to officially welcome people. Um, first of all, um, there's, a, there's a, an, an announcement from the children's conference side of things. It was noticed that after the conference was over, uh, Parents are supposed to pick up their children or at least have them with them because the team will not always be with them. So the children are playing near the swimming pool, climbing over the bridge, chasing the zebras. Hosty, <laughs> hosty, <laughs> or something. <laughs> but please, I mean, it's dangerous. It is dangerous. The pool, the bridge, the animals, please. Parents, after the conference is over, Please pick up the children, be with your children. And then the buses, an announcement from transfer people. The buses normally park here, uh, but they're finding it dif difficulty to climb the divide. So now we actually park the buses on that side. So don't go looking for the buses this side. That's all buses. They see you, everyone. Uh, the buses are on that side now. So you go out this way to the main car park, to the buses. And then last night I forgot to announce Lita. The, the, it's noticed also, you know, I don't know why we, we, we have this culture of throwing Lita just about anywhere. Uh, we've got 40 bins or so where you can throw Lita. Please do not litter the place. Please find the bin. If you see Lita, pick it up and please throw it in a bin. And it's especially so after we eat. It seems there's quite a bit of littering going on. Please, let's keep the surrounding clean. And then the last one for now is uh, those needing accommodation, remember. Uh, if you've come today and you don't have accommodation, please come to the front and sit here. Immediately we are done so that the accommodation team can come and arrange where you're going uh, to sleep. If you haven't registered, if you haven't paid, please do so. We, uh, we, haven't, been ex we haven't been extremely strict on the budgets, but we intend to be. So if you don't have a badge like I don't have a badge, <laughs> you will be asked what's happening. Uh, please play, pay and then get, get your badge. Register and pay. Uh, as Pastor Mbewe is coming up, just some books. There's a book stand there, Pastor Mbewe can come up. There's a book stand, as you know, from um, Publishing Ministry, uh, Evergreen Bookstore, many of you are familiar with that, but just some books that they've got there. This is a book by Stuart Olliot, was supposed to come here, I think, one or two conferences ago, but couldn't make it for some reason. Uh, Romans, the gospel as it really is, and it's going for 240. Each one of these, if you buy, comes with a complimentary book. Uh, Death in Adam and Life in Christ, the doctrine of imputation, a very imp important doctrine of imputation, J.V. Uh, Fesco, going for 250. Uh, pastoral preaching by Dr. Conrad Mbewe, who's standing next to me here. 350 kwacha, also comes with a complimentary. Shepherding a Child's Heart, this is Ted Tripp, who's been here before to preach and teach here at our conferences. And this is 270 kwacha. Uh, Vodi Bokam, whom you all know, I don't know if he's here tonight, but uh, this is if you want to understand the social justice movement and the evangelicalism's looming catastrophe, as he sees it. Fault lines, Vodi Bokam, and it's for 500 kwacha. And then a man who probably needs no introduction, really. Uh, Pastor John MacArthur has been around in the ministry, one ministry for over 50 years now. Pastoral ministry by this man, John MacArthur. How to shepherd biblically. Uh, 670 kwacha, but worth the money. And uh, obviously with a side book if you do buy it. Pastor Mbele. All right, well, brethren, uh, it's good to see you here. Uh, it's the little um, process that I normally get through 
of uh, welcoming us. We won't do it as individuals. Uh, we will do it as much as possible in batches. We still expect that some people will be arriving Wednesday, Thursday, but would rather do the welcoming as soon as possible in the schedule. We would have done it last night, but I, we always know that Mondays people are still traveling and you know, sort of going straight uh, to rest wherever they are. So because of that, we deliberately are starting uh, today. Now, start as far afield as possible and then uh, come in. And so we beginning with those that are coming from outside Zambia. Uh, we have got six countries. One of them is where our speakers are coming from. So we won't ask them to stand because uh, I'm sure they've already done that a few times, both last night and today. That leaves us with uh, five other countries. The last one is Zambia, and so we'll come to Zambia a little later on. Uh, but we also have, at least I'm told, there is uh, New Zealand. I know there is Nigeria because uh, they took over KBC last Sunday, and there have been a few uh, interns from there as well. There's Kenya as well because uh, one of the tallest guys here competing with Rob <laughs> quite favorably is from there and I've seen him and then um, Botswana yes uh, Botswana as well so other than the Americans the rest of you from such countries please stand so that we welcome you okay I can see Botswana there yes yes okay Standing up, standing up, standing up. All right, so let's welcome these brethren. Okay, thank you, thank you. You may be, you may be seated. All right, and uh, I've been told that uh, although only uh, six countries in that sense are present, including Zambia, the actual countries other than Zambia registered as 17 altogether, and so the others are live streaming. Then secondly, we come to the rest of the country, and uh, again, to, because there are 10 provinces, we, what we will do is Lusaka will welcome the rest. Okay, so 10 provinces in Zambia and 10 provinces registered. So we have people from right across the country of Zambia. Okay, so because most people are from Lusaka, Lusaka people remain seated, and then if you have come from anywhere else, please stand. Lusaka as a province, sit. Okay, because Lusaka is also a city. So if you're from Kafue, you know, or Chongwe, where I normally go, you know, and so on, if you can remain seated. Okay, so the rest of the country, please arise. We want to see you. All right. Okay, so there are a few more taking time to arise. Okay, let's welcome the rest of the country. Let's welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Again, to just express the fact that we recognize uh, like those coming from other countries, that it's cost you an arm and a leg to be here, and we trust that uh, we are giving you the hospitality that is saying we appreciate your presence here. And then um, for, for Lusaka, uh, yeah, let's still at least welcome ourselves. So please, if you're within Lusaka, stand, and then the rest of us will welcome you. Lusaka, come on. Come on, Lusaka. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. All right, everybody else, let's welcome the Lusaka. Thank you very much. You may be seated. You may be seated. It feels nice to be welcomed in your own home. Just one or two final pieces of information. Uh, one is purely because I'm very biased and it's to do with the African Christian University. The, this this is, doesn't happen anywhere else, but this university has closed for this week, entire week. 
not because the students want to come and attend the conference, but so that they can serve you. Now, if I was among the charismatics, there would have been a little more life to that announcement. <laughs> eh? Yeah, come on. <laughs> so, you see them all over the grounds. They've taken a whole week because here's a university that is teaching students to serve. Okay, so when you do meet them, they are registering you, they are working in the car park, they are helping with food and everything. Please show them your gratitude as well. Lastly, between the last conference that we held, like this, in a physical place, and today, and especially in the last one year, we've lost a number of friends who've gone to glory. And we just felt that it would be appropriate to use the opportunity to just acknowledge uh, they are going ahead of us in that sense. Um, last year, around about this time, we, we lost Pastor Michael Wembia, who was pastor for Trinity Baptist Church in um, Livingston. He was an ongoing supporter of this conference almost from the start. So one can safely say for almost uh, 30 years. Right from the time he graduated from Tika then, went to serve in Mansa and then moved over to Pika and then finally to Trinity in Livingston where he saved most of his life. Would like to just acknowledge the fact that he went to his reward uh, about this time last year. Another ardent supporter of this conference was uh, Irving Stegels, uh, a pastor in South Africa. He wasn't just coming every year as much as he could, but he ensured that he brought other young South Africans to come over here uh, for the conference. And so when he came, there would normally be about five or 10 other individuals with him. Well, uh, he also uh, left us in the last few years and has gone to glory. In case we get accused of just remembering men, uh, we also remember Mrs. Chishiva Chivuta. Um, there's something about what used to happen with this conference, and it is the fact that the conference ended on a Friday, and on Saturday, there would be a breakfast for those of you coming from outside uh, the city of Lusaka that would be hosted before you get onto buses and planes and head out to the rest of your countries. And uh, the people that initially hosted it was uh, Dr. and Mrs. Mpoka, and Dr. Mpoka died somewhere along the way. And then uh, the Chibutas took over, and then Mr. Chibuta died somewhere along the way. And uh, last year, Mrs. Chibuta also died and went to heaven. So at the end of this conference, sorry, no breakfast. We hope you're not thinking that it's dangerous to host a breakfast <laughs> <in this room>. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> we are looking for volunteers <laughs> who we'll discover how African you are if, if no one volunteers after this. Okay, but on a more serious note, finally, um, it is uh, Pastor Ashu Blaze in uh, the United Kingdom, who also went to heaven uh, in the last few days. And uh, what most of you may not know was that he first came to Zambia in 1989 and uh, shared out the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith wherever he went, so small little copies, because it was the 300th anniversary of that conference, I mean that uh, document. And it was then that he was invited to speak at what was called the Elbisites, then. And it was an annual conference. And when it was over, he got a number of us who were pastors together and said to us, 
why don't you start an annual conference hosted by one of your churches? Because you are now pastors. And that's how this conference was born the following year, and he offered to be the first speaker. So he came back, he spoke at a very first conference together with uh, probably the closest to being an octogenarian, uh, Reverend Alfred Nyerenda here. Uh, there were our two speakers, so we hope you continue to be around for a few more conferences. <laughs> We're not yet ready to say bye to him. So I thought we'd just mention those names. There are obviously a few more other people that have since gone to glory, and it's not that we've overlooked them deliberately, it's just that we needed to at least mention some and acknowledge them. I think that's all for me. Thank you. Uh, we're going to sing a song before uh, Pastor Rob Ventura comes. Um, he's coming to deal with the second part of uh, the truth concerning the cross. I hope he hasn't changed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I'll ask that we, we stand and uh, sing, Bind Us Together, Lord. upon our time. Let's pray together.
magisterial name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Father, we come this evening as your servants, looking for good to come from you to us, looking for you, O God, to invade this place with your presence and power and person. O God, we're asking that you would do us good in this time. We're asking, O God, that you would challenge us and convict us and conform us more and more into that blessed moral image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're asking, O God, that you would not leave us to ourselves, but that you would give us help from on high. O God, we call upon you this night to be our portion and our aid, to be our very present help in time of need. I'm asking, O God, that you would feed your people with the finest wheat of your word, that they might be built up in their most holy faith and continue to glorify you in all that they do, say, and think. O God, we pray that you would speak through your holy word. Speak, O great God, for your servants listen. We pray and ask all of these things in that glorious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It was Charles Simeon, that great expository preacher from another generation who rightly said that it may well be supposed that any revelation claiming to be from God should, in addition to all external evidences, have internal proofs also of its divine origin. For if God should reveal a way of salvation, we should expect it to be in such a way as to display the riches of his own grace and to secure all the glory for himself. Simeon writes, quote, and when we look to the gospel of Christ, we find precisely such a method of salvation revealed to us, for it differs from all the methods that have ever been devised by men, for according to the Bible, the gospel gives all the glory to God alone. Now, dear brothers and sisters here this evening, it is without a doubt that our great and glorious God should alone get all the glory when it comes to our salvation. You see, despite what some teach and preach in our day, this is to be the case. And this is because it is God himself who devised the Bible's plan of salvation. Thus you and I should regularly say with the hymn writer of old, to God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Now to be sure, when God saves a sinner, he absolutely transforms them. I mean, since the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, as, even as we considered last night, when one experiences the great power of the gospel, it comprehensively begins to change that person, so much so that Paul says in 2 Corinthians Chapter 5 and verse 17, that if anyone, underscore it, anyone, whoever they are, man, woman, boy, or girl, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation, old things have passed away, behold, or look and see, all things have become new. Well, what is this matter then of gospel transformation that we come to consider in our time together for this next message from the book of Romans. This evening, we're going to consider three profound implications that flow to us from the gospel of God's grace. And as we come to do this, I ask you please to turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, here is Paul has just spoken in the previous words about four crucial results that flow to us from the cross of Christ as we saw this morning, namely imputation, justification, redemption, and propitiation, he now puts forth three important matters for us to consider in the last few verses of this chapter. Here, as he puts forth the vital effects 
which are to mark all of us as the people of God, both for our good and the good of others. He mentions the first one in verses 27 and 28 of this chapter, which is the matter of gospel humiliation, our first heading for this evening. Gospel humiliation. And so notice with me then what he writes here. He says in verse 27 of this chapter, where is boasting then? He answers, it is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Now, it might seem a bit odd to us, a bit a weird, if you will, that the Apostle Paul, having just spoken in the previous words about all that God has done for us in Christ, not what we've done in ourselves to make ourselves right with God, no, but all that God has done for us in Christ, that Paul now, after that last section, now brings up this whole matter with reference to boasting. I mean, since deliverance from the wrath of God comes to us solely, entirely, exclusively through what Jesus did in our place when he died as our sin-bearing substitute, why then does Paul ask here in our verse in view, where is boasting then? Now listen, if uh, you and I uh, made ourselves uh, right uh, before God by our own performance, then there might be boasting from us. I mean, if justification before a holy God were, in fact, by the works of the law, then perhaps boasting would not be excluded. Ah, but brethren, I ask the question, what does the Bible say? What does it tell us? Well, it tells us, as Paul says in verse 20 of this chapter, look at the words, that by the deeds of the law, or by our attempts, our strivings, our efforts to keep it, no flesh, that is to say no person, regardless of who they are, or regardless of who they think they are, no flesh will be or can be justified in the sight of God. And so you see, listen, when you and I understand that the only thing that we contribute to our salvation is our sin... We will then understand that when it comes to our salvation, all boasting is excluded. Yes, when we understand this, we will say with Jonah of old that salvation is of the Lord. And we will gladly say with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 31, let him who glories glory in the Lord. And so, in view of what I just said, I pause to ask all of you here this evening, are you one who glories in the Lord concerning your salvation, or do you glory in yourself? Do you glory in the Lord, or do you glory in yourself? Now, as good Calvinists in this room, I know you all glory in the Lord, amen? You glory in the Lord. You do say with Paul of all that the one who glories, glory in the Lord. But I ask, as you think about how you came to know Christ, do you have anything to boast in other than the free grace of God which has been shown to you? Well, you know what the answer is. The answer is no. We have nothing to boast in with reference to ourselves. The answer is we have nothing to boast in in the least. For as... Matthew Henry, the great Bible commentator, rightly says, if we were saved by our own works, we might then put the crown upon our own heads. Ah, but since the way of justification is by faith alone, this forever excludes all boasting. Oh, but perhaps someone here uh, says this evening, but pastor... I was the one who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ so that I could be saved. And so there must be something in this to boast about before him. Well, actually, friend, there's not. And I say this because even your belief in Christ, which you exercised in his finished work, was a gift of God. This is the case. 
Thus, this is why the Apostle Paul could say in Ephesians 2 and verse 8 that by grace we have been saved through faith and that not of ourselves. The salvation and the faith, not of ourselves. Rather, it is a gift of God. Why? Lest anyone should boast. And so simply stated, listen, as reformed Christians, you and I believe in a gospel which is free from all self-boasting. We believe and hopefully practice not the religions of the Pharisees who boasted in themselves before God that they were good, no, but rather I trust that we continually say with Paul in Galatians chapter 6, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the scholars spend much time here in Romans chapter 3 uh, discussing the whole matter of who it is that Paul is addressing in 27a of this chapter. I mean, is he thinking here about what a Jewish people do in their religion? Or is he thinking about what the Gentiles do in theirs? Well, to be honest, uh, sadly, uh, typically it's, it's both, right? I mean, Paul has already said to us in Romans chapter 2 and verse 23 with reference to the Jews that they may, quote, their boast in the law of God. And then in speaking in a similar way with reference to the Gentiles, he says in chapter 1 and verse 30 of this book, that they are, quote, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, and boasters. And so again, I ask, who does Paul specifically have in mind here in verse 27 of this chapter? Well, uh, personally, I believe that it's all people everywhere, all people everywhere, regardless of who they are or where they're from, it's all people everywhere. For as Calvin rightly says, quote, the whole human race has been infected with the disease of pride. Well, as Paul continues his discussion here, he goes on in the second part of verse 27 to answer his own question of where is boasting then. You see, since people receive justification before a holy God, freely as a gift of his grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, as he says in verse 24 of this chapter, he says now in 27b of this chapter, note the words again in your Bibles, he says that all boasting is excluded. If you're looking at a Greek New Testament, literally the words say that all boasting is shut out, aorist tense verb, once for all time. Now, of course, listen, of course, uh, such a fact as this, goes against much of the nonsensical things which people say in our day. I mean, today when you ask people the question, on what basis they think that they will go to heaven, typically they say something like this, well, I've tried to be a good person, and I've never hurt anyone, I've kept the golden rule, you've heard that before, right? I should go to heaven because I kept the golden rule. I've helped old ladies across the street. Therefore, surely God should accept me in the final day. Uh, they say I've never lied or I've done my best not to lie, etc. And so, dear ones, here this evening, what do we see in all of these things? Well, what we see is pure boasting. We see individuals glorying in themselves about why it is that God should receive them in the final day, forgetting all the while that Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 64 that all of our righteousness before God is as filthy rags. And if our righteousness is like filthy rags in his sight, what must our unrighteousness look like before him? Well, Paul asks next then in our passage, concerning the matter of boasting. Look at the language. By what law is it excluded? Or perhaps a better understood, we might say, by what method or principle is this so? He asks first, is it the principle or the method of works, which is to say that of our own strivings to be as good as we possibly could be, which of course we can never be 
good enough for God since he requires perfection from us. And so how then does Paul answer his own question? Well, look at the language. He answers it quite emphatically by saying next, no, no, not by the principle or method of works. A better translated, he says, never. And then he says, but, or on the contrary, all boasting is excluded. By the law, or again we might say, by the principle of faith, which is to say, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ alone for life and salvation. Now, as you know, uh, being good Bible students that you are, uh, the Apostle Paul has been putting forth this matter of the principle of faith as the sole means, not grounds, no, but sole means of our receiving salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, all throughout this epistle. I mean, right from the beginning of this book, he does this. Saying to us, for example, even in verse 22 of this chapter, that the righteousness of God comes to us through faith in Christ Jesus to all and on all who believe. Additionally, in chapter 1 and verse 16 of this book, we considered it last night together. The Apostle Paul says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And so, in view of this point, dear brothers and sisters here this evening, I say, may it be that you and I never forget a very simple but vital, important Bible truth, which is that faith alone in Christ alone is the sole instrument of one being saved. Faith, not works, not baptism, not uh, joining the church, no, but faith as the singular means through which we receive God's wonderful gift of salvation to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, uh, just in case, just in case, Paul wasn't clear about this whole matter. He was, but just in case, he wasn't. He goes on next in verse 28 of this chapter to summarize this whole point to us. Here is he explains this issue quite plainly so that really no one should miss it. He says next, note the words with me in your Bibles, he writes in verse 28, therefore we, that is we who are Christians, we who hold to the apostolic biblical gospel, he says therefore we conclude or reckon it to be the, the case that a man, that is uh, any person, whoever they are, wherever they're from, he says that a man is justified or legally declared not guilty before God, and this by faith, look at the language, apart from, or more literally, completely without the deeds of the law, which is to say any of our attempts to be made right with God by our own faulty efforts. Now, as some of you might know, this particular verse here that we're considering now, this particular verse was one of the key verses which sparked the Protestant Reformation. This is the case, and this is because this passage plainly teaches the glorious doctrine of sola fide, which is to say that God pardons guilty sinners not by what they do know, but only through faith in what Christ has done. In fact, this text here, is so clear in this regard that Martin Luther even inserted the little word alone after the word faith in this verse in his German translation of the Bible. Now, of course, when Luther did this, he was sharply criticized by the Catholics for doing this. Ah, but dear ones here this evening, even though this was the case, the truth of the matter is that this is exactly what Paul is teaching here. Exactly what he's teaching here. We conclude, therefore, that a man is justified by faith, sola, 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 by faith alone and not by works. So let's not look too harshly at Luther for putting the word alone there. 
He was capturing the essence of the whole matter. He was grabbing the heart of the whole thing. This is the fact of the matter. Thus, I agree with Sproul when he writes that this verse, quote, more than any other single verse in all of Scripture, most clearly articulates the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Therefore, we conclude, we reckon that a man is justified by faith alone, apart from the deeds of the law. Ah, but having said this, of course, the Catholics respond and say, oh, but what about what James says in his epistle when he says in James 2 and verse 24 that you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And so I ask, brethren, is James contradicting Paul? I say nay. I say nay. Not at all. Not at all. And this is because when we read Paul and James in their context, we see that James is not at all reversing Paul's teaching. And this is because in his epistle, he's not dealing with how one gets right with God, as Paul is dealing with in the book of Romans, no. Rather, he's dealing with the whole matter of two kinds of faith. Two kinds of faith. That is to say, a said faith or a false faith versus a real faith. He's dealing with the matter of a dead faith versus a true faith, which, by the way, if one has saving faith, it'll always produce a life of good works towards others. For although good works are not the root of our salvation, good works are certainly the fruit of our salvation. Well, not only will a true salvation produce in us who believe gospel humiliation, because we see secondly now in the following verses, verses 29 and 30 of this chapter, that it will also produce gospel integration. Gospel integration. Look at what Paul says. Here in speaking about God, he writes saying, verse 29, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Paul answers and says, yes, of the Gentiles also. Why, Paul? Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith, that is to say the Jews, and the uncircumcised through faith, that is to say the Gentiles. Now, what Paul says here in this verse is absolutely crucial for you and I to get. And I say this because sadly some miss the point of this passage altogether because they don't really understand that at this time in history there was great segregation between Jews and Gentiles. Now, now there's much that could be said about this whole matter. But suffice it to say, between Jews and non-Jews in the first century, there were great racial tensions. There was tremendous hostility between them. And I say this because many Gentiles despised the Jews, and many Jews considered the Gentiles to be dogs, being people whose minds were, quote, always intent upon idolatry, as one famous rabbi wrote. Ah, but friends, I ask the simple question. What happens when a person gets saved? I mean, does gospel transformation really take place in them? Well, brethren, blessed be God that it does. Blessed be God that the gospel makes people who were once at odds with each other to become loving brethren who are part of the same Christian family. Glory be to God. This is the case. Consequently, when the gospel comes in power to a person that breaks down the walls of divisions that he had with others, whether nationally or culturally or economically or racially or socially, etc. 
Thus, this is why Paul could say to us in Galatians chapter 3 that there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. And why is this, Paul? Well, he tells us, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Well, what glorious good news this is, amen? It's glorious news, dear brothers and sisters. It's wonderful news which tells us that when the gospel comes in power to people, it makes us one in God's Son. One in God's Son. Note the words again in your Bibles, picking up in verse 29. Paul asks here, saying, Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles? To which he answers emphatically again and says, Yes! A thousand times yes! Ah, but why is this the case? Well, he answers the question in verse 30 when he says, note it with me there, since, or as the King James Version of the Bible has it, seeing there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. And so what's Paul's point in these words here? Well, in setting forth the monotheistic belief of the Bible, namely that there is only one God, he says that because this is the case, his method of justifying all sinners is the same, which again is by faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, simply stated, dear brethren here this evening, since Jesus has broken down the middle wall of separation between the races and has made us new men and women in himself, practically speaking, what does it mean? This is what it means. All believers are to be loved. All believers are to be respected. And all believers are to be cared for and to be prayed for regardless of their backgrounds, etc. And so may God help all of us in this regard. Right? May he help us. May it be that the Bible's portrait of gospel integration will be that which we will see in our churches more and more. And this to the glory and praise of God alone. Well, Paul has one last thing to speak of in view of all that he's been saying. In verses 21 to 26 of this chapter, having just spoken again about the two effects that come to us who are saved, gospel humiliation and gospel integration. And now he takes up the important issue that his original order, original readers rather, might have been wondering about at this point in this letter. And we'll consider it under the third heading of gospel continuation. Gospel continuation. Since the apostle has already taught that the law of God cannot save us. He's already taught that in this book, for it's absolutely powerless to do this. And, and since he has earnestly defended the doctrine of justification before a holy God through faith alone in Christ alone, apart from any work that we do, the question in 31a of this chapter is this. Look at the words again in your Bibles. He asks, do we then make void, or perhaps better understood, do we then set aside or uh, nullify the law through faith? A, a very logical uh, question, again, that uh, Paul is anticipating that uh, some of his readers would have been thinking at this point in the epistle. Some of Paul's readers would have been thinking about this very thing. Well, while some of the original readers might have answered Paul at this point by saying, yes, we do, Paul replies back by saying, no, we don't. In fact, he writes in verse 31b of this chapter by way of another emphatic negation saying that we do not make void the law through faith, but on the contrary, we, that is, we who are Christians, establish, look at the word, we establish, or better understood, we uphold and validate the law, 
which is to say the moral law of God as summarized in the Ten Commandments. And so, what's the point? Well, here it is. The point is, although you and I who are the people of God in this place are freed from the condemning power of the law, this does not mean that we are free from the prescribing power of the law. Freed from the condemning power of the law, but not the prescribing power of the law. The point is, listen carefully, God did not save us so that we would then become lawless. No. Rather, he saved us to the end that we would become law-abiding followers of Jesus Christ our Lord. He saved us and wrote his law on our hearts so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I would seek to obey his commandments all of our days. Thus, there is to be in us a gospel continuation concerning the things of God. There is to be in us, simply stated, an evangelical doing of the commandments of God and this not in order to be saved, no, but because we have been saved. Well, here then, in the last few verses of this glorious chapter, we have three vital implications which a true spirit-wrought salvation is to produce in the lives of those who have Received it. This is the case, and what are they? Well, first, there is to be no boasting in ourselves, but only boasting in Jesus Christ our Lord. Second, there is to be no discrimination among us, but rather a fully orbed gospel integration. And then, thirdly, there is to be no antinomianism among us or, or a throwing off of God's commandments but rather we are to seek to keep the commandments of God as an expression of our love to Him. And so, having said all those things, dear ones here this evening, I, I ask you who name the name of the Lord, are these three gospel implications being manifested in your lives. Right? So, so, so we, we preach a sermon. We, we seek to open up the text. We proclaim it. We explain it. So, so now we apply it. I've got to apply it to you, dear brother, dear sister here this evening. Are these are three gospel implications being manifested in your life? So that you're one who glories in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you're one who uh, uh, seeks to put away all discrimination in your heart with reference to others. And, and you're one who seeks to say with the psalmist of old, Oh, how I love your law! It is my meditation all the day long. Friend, is this you, a dear Christian here this evening? Is this you by the help and grace of God? Well, I hope it is. I hope it is. I hope that the import of this passage is now weighing heavy upon your heart in the best sense of the word. I pray that as you consider the various headings, you ask yourself, Lord, is this, are these things which are true for me? May it always be, dear ones. May it be so for all of us in this place and where we have fallen short. May it be that we repent this evening and ask God to forgive us and to help us to be found walking in His ways all of our days. These are the things which are to be part of our lives. For us who have been saved by the grace of God, these implications are to be the various matters which mark us out all of our days, and so may God give us help. May He give us the grace to walk in His ways all of our days. And so, 
I close this evening with a word to any non-Christian in this place. You're here tonight and you have not been made right with God by faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone. And so I ask you a simple question. Why is this? Why is this? Why haven't you been made right with God through Christ? Why? Well, what's the answer to the question? Well, well perhaps uh, many answers could be given. But dear friend here this evening, you who are not truly born again, let me say that I believe that ultimately, I believe that you're not saved because you still have way too much boasting in yourself. You think there, there really is something in you which will commend you to God in the final day. Friend, let me clue you. There's nothing in you which will do this at all. Before the eyes of the perfect God of the Bible with whom we have to do, we are all as an unclean thing. There is not a just man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is nothing in you to commend you to God at all. And so I say, my dear friend here this evening, my dear nun, Christian friend, you need to own your sinnerhood before God. You need to see yourself as God sees you, as a hell-deserving individual. Oh, you say, but, but I've been nice today. I, I obeyed mom and dad today. Oh, my friend, unless you're perfect, you're not going to heaven. You've got to be perfect in thought, word, and deed in order to get into heaven. Of the perfect God of the Bible lets no one in his presence, in and of themselves, who's not perfect. And so unless you think you're perfect, you need to be saved. You need to find someone who lived the life that you should have lived and then died the death that you deserve to die. You need to find someone who could commend you completely to God Almighty. And blessed be God, you don't need to look real far. Because that one is Jesus Christ the Lord. He is the Savior of sinners. He came into the world, sinners to save. And I remember when I was being drawn to the Lord uh, 30 years ago. And when God saved me, I, I would have this, th this thought as, I'm in the bleachers and I'm looking down at Christ's life and I'm seeing his, his life of active obedience and, and just how perfectly he lived. He never sinned once in thought, word, or deed. And yet, all that he's doing isn't for himself. He's doing it for me as my representative. And I'm in the bleachers cheering him on, saying, Go, Jesus, go. Keep that perfect life for me. Keep it for me. And, and he lived pleasing to the Father at every moment of his life. Uh, the very thing that I had not done, but, but he did it for me as my representative, a perfect in himself. Which of you can accuse me of sin, said the Savior? No one. And I'm watching him, and I see that beautiful, that glorious, perfect life under the law of God, so that, as Isaiah said, Messiah magnified the law and honored it. He kept it perfect for me. And then he takes that perfect, flawless, impeccable life and he goes to the cross in his passive obedience. And there, he allows my sin and the sin of all of his people to be placed upon him. And then he's punished in, in my room and in our room instead. And there, he makes a full and a final and a free atonement to God Almighty. And he cried, accomplished it for you. And we repent and we believe upon his accomplished work. And we are saved. And I remember when God saved me just thinking about the life of Christ and his death on my behalf and just praising God for all of it. My dear non-Christian friend here this night, Jesus Christ is everything that you need to be accepted by God. 
And in the gospel, he freely offers himself to you. He will commend you to God. He died as the just one for the unjust ones that he might bring us to God. And so my non-Christian friend here this night, stop looking inward. Look outward. Don't look to yourself. Don't boast in your so-called temporal good deeds here and there. No, they're all tainted with sin. But Jesus never sinned. And in love, he willingly took the sins of sinners upon himself and sacrificed himself in their place. He died for every sinner who believes upon him alone for life and salvation. My dear unsaved friend, I commend Jesus to you. And I call you this night to believe upon him. Take him to be your Lord and God. Take him to be your Lord and Master. Take us in John chapter 1 as many received him. To them and them only he gave the right to become the children of God. Again, I go back to Romans 10 because our minds are on the book of Romans. Foolish thing it is to think that, that I could commend myself to you. Oh God, no, but you've sent a Savior to do for me what I could never do for myself. Therefore, I turn from myself, I turn from my sins, and I turn to Christ. And I believe upon Him alone for the saving of my soul. Are you young children here this night being reared in the things of God? Oh, listen to me. God has given you this special time. The special time in your lives where your parents are teaching you the things of God. Don't squander this time. The Bible says today if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Now, today is the day of salvation. Not, not tomorrow. You don't know what... Tomorrow will bring. Tomorrow is promised to no one. Thus the Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what may come forth. And you recall, dear children, the, the story of, of Spurgeon as a young boy and, and his uh, a grandfather, I believe, or grandmother would bring him to uh, the cemetery there and, and show a Spurgeon the, these, the, these little tombstones and these small little uh, etchings in the ground where, where little children were lying, little children who had died, uh, putting in Spurgeon's mind that I must not put off my salvation. You see, becoming a Christian is not something for adults only, no. It's for young children. It's for old persons. Whoever you are, come to Christ tonight. Or come to Him by faith. He's the only Savior of sinners. And He's a willing Savior. And He's a loving Savior. He's a gracious Savior. He says, the one who comes to me, I'm not going to put him aside. You see, you might think other people would say, oh, you're just not good enough for me. And no, Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus receives Sinners, all kinds of sinners. And of course, the religious people in his day mocked him and saying, look, he eats with tax collectors and sinners. Uh, no kidding. That's why he came. He came for the outcast. He came for sinners. Came for old people, young people. People from all different backgrounds, regardless of who they are or where they're from. Be saved this evening. My dear non-Christian friend, and know the joys of salvation. Know what it is to be reconciled to God. Know what it is to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Know what it is to be translated out of the kingdom of darkness and put into the kingdom of God's Son. Know what it is to have fellowship with God and communion with Him. Oh, I say there's no greater life than being a Christian. To know God. To wake up every day in Christo, in Christ, no longer in Adam, no longer dead in trespasses and sins, but to be in Christ. And to know that uh, He is my Savior and He is my Redeemer. And that in my life He will be with me. And that at the time of death He will usher me into 
glory. Know the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe upon him and be saved. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are thankful for your word. Indeed, it is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And we're asking, O oh God, this evening that it would do its work. That it would sanctify the saved and that it would save the lost. Oh God, we pray that you would go after some this evening, especially who do not know you. Show them their sinnerhood before yourself. And then show them the lovely and living Lord Jesus Christ who receives all who call upon him by faith. Oh God, do us good, we pray. Seal these truths to our hearts, we ask. And pray these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank God for his word. In his introduction, the preacher quoted 2 Corinthians 5.17, that if anyone is in Christ, is a new creation. If this evening you can say yes to the question, has your life changed? There is hope for you as a, as a Christian. If you say no to that question, probably you've not been saved. So may we hit the challenge that has come. For those of us who are Christians here, we'll be singing as we we'll be closing, Jesus keep me near the cross. And the hymn writer in the chorus says, he would rather glory forever in the cross. Is that where your glory is? I'll ask that uh, we spend about a minute or so just to think about the message we have heard and uh, talk to God appropriately. Let's pray. Well, if as we bowed our head down, your prayer was that of asking God for mercy, we'd like to challenge you that you don't dash off when we are done. Uh, see the preacher, see one of the, our pastors who are around here, our elders, or any Christian that you know, because they would like to help you to know how you can grow as a Christian. I'll ask that we stand as we sing our closing song, and I'll, after that I'll invite the other daughter to come with the closing announcements and also close our time in prayer. Can you stand with me, please?
pray together. Blessed God and uh, Father in heaven, we still our hearts again for a moment before you to drink in the words that you've spoken to us, both Christian and non-Christian, uh, through your servant this evening. And our Father, we simply ask by your spirit, may these words find room in the hearts of each one that is seated here and those that are listening or watching by live stream. Oh Lord, grant that your spirit may do his work in the Christian and in the non-Christian. We want to thank you, O oh God, for this second day. And we pray as we go that you may help us to meditate on these words and meditate on the things that we have learned in this day. We want to ask for safety as each one of us goes to our homes tonight, for protection as well through the night. And our Father, that you might bring us back tomorrow again to feast on these things and to fellowship one with another to the glory of your name. We pray you may forgive us of any sin, O oh God, for we do not presume to be without sin, even in this day. Cleanse us by the blood of Christ. Again, O oh God, we pray, may your spirit bring meaning, O oh God, into our hearts by these words. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So just to announce the program for tomorrow, um, 
in the uh, family conference for tomorrow in case you don't have the program. At, at, first of all, we start with the prayer meeting, by the way, 9 hours to 9.30. In here, everybody in here, 9 hours to 9.30. The children, 9 hours at their conference. And then 9.30, we begin the sessions in the family conference in the Word from Ezra chapter 7. After tea break, take note again, there is a change. If you have the program, it will show Pastor Kalifunga on Ephesians. It's actually Pastor Mbewe on be doing an overview of the book of Second Timothy. So it's Pastor Mbewe and a young person. So that's in the family conference in the tent. And then in the school of Theo 6, this one and two, the first part, and then our brother Mark Rines will be doing the same um, uh, a teaching that he did in a family conference, but now in the School of Theology, which is uh, Ezra's love for God's word from Ezra 7. Then the seminar here will be by Pastor Said Shimba, Enriching Marriage with Special Application to Millennials. That's in the uh, School of Theology. And then in the evening, both services, Pastor Ventura will be taking the second part of the overview of the truth of, of sanctification from Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 10. And then uh, advance announcement for Thursday. I did mention uh, Reb Kaz, the uh, Baptist Churches Association of Zambia meeting, 16 hours to 17 hours in this very room. It's a siesta time, but please, in the family conference on Thursday, is not a dash or a debate from the African Christian university students so please announcement and then lastly from the clinic the doctors advise that there is free testing of blood sugar and blood pressure um, from there where from where they are standing or sitting uh, this these are silent killers and many among them including myself suffer from that so there's free testing uh, please make your way to the clinic sometime during this time for free testing and then in terms of our vision, uh, the vision of the School of Divinity and a God-centered worldview. And really that, and everybody keeps using the term seminary, seminary, seminary. A school of divinity is moral decline, is that you divorce